This man is trying to break 1,000 miles an hour on land. His name is Roscoe McGlashan and he has so much passion and grit for motorsport and engineering that I think he might just do it. I'm Roscoe McGlashan and I'm going to be the fastest man on earth. I spoke to him to understand how he's gone from a rocket powered 250 miles an hour go-kart to designing a 200,000 horsepower vehicle with the potential to break 1,000 miles per hour and the engineering behind it. So we're talking about the land speed record here and that's a record that's been broken many times over the years. So let's take a really brief look at how the cars have developed. The first ever land speed record was recorded in 1989 in France. And I love this, it was only three years after the first ever car was invented. The car was actually powered by an electric motor and completed a flying kilometer in 57 seconds, which is a massive 39.24 miles per hour. The competition then quickly raged on, being broken another four times before passing through the 60 miles an hour barrier with the first vehicle produced specifically for this record, the Jamais Contant, just four months later. It then took another five years to break through the 100 miles per hour barrier in 1904 with this 15 litre machine that produced a massive 50 horsepower. But it then took 23 years to break the 200 miles an hour barrier with the beautiful Sunbeam 1000 horsepower, also called the Slug. This car had two 22 litre aircraft engines and although it had 1000 horsepower in its name, it was actually closer to 900. The next milestone was 300 miles an hour and things were progressing quickly, with this record only taking another eight Eight years to surpass, with Malcolm Campbell at the wheel in 1935. So Malcolm hopes to be the first man to achieve a speed of 300 miles per hour. Again, this is a beautiful car, this time using a 37-litre Rolls-Royce V12 producing 2,300 horsepower. So the next barrier to be broken was 400 miles an hour in 1963, and this is when we get rid of the internal combustion engine and turn instead to jets. However, it is worth noting that a top speed of 400 miles an hour had already been surpassed by John Cobb in 1947. 400 miles per hour on the ground using 48 litres of internal combustion engine, although not across back-to-back -back runs, which is required for the official record. But it was Craig Breedlove who was officially the first person to break the 400 mile an hour barrier. Craig Breedlove wants to build and drive the world's fastest car and break the world land speed record. Craig was driving the Spirit of America, a turbojet powered vehicle that got to 407 miles an hour over one mile in 1963. But a record that was to be broken another 40 times in 1964, with Craig then being the first person to break the 500 mile an hour barrier in the Spirit of America Sonic 1, with a more powerful jet from an F4 Phantom 2. 600 miles an hour was broken through in 1970 by the Blue Flame a rocket-powered vehicle producing 22,000 pounds of thrust, pushing it to a top speed of just over 650 miles per hour. On October 23, 1970, Gary Gabelich secured himself one more time in the cockpit of the Blue Flame, a car designed with one purpose in mind, to capture the land speed record. It then took another 27 years to break the 700 mile an hour barrier in September 1997 with Andy Green and the Thrust SSC. This footage was from just three weeks later when the Thrust SSC completed another run and averaged 763 miles an hour over a mile. So what happened after this? Well actually, this is the last time the land speed record was broken, 26 years ago. So is it even possible to break 1000 miles an hour? Well Andy seemed to think so and was more than right with his production from 1997. You could build a thousand mile an hour car but I think the technology and the sheer money involved, it would take you about 20 years to do it. But don't worry, the story doesn't end there. We do have a race to 1,000 miles an hour, and the contenders are the Bloodhound LSR team and Roscoe McGlashan with the Aussie Invader 5R, who I spoke to on the Driver 61 podcast. Roscoe is an incredibly interesting guy. So before we get into the engineering, let me tell you a little bit more about him and the crazy machinery he's driven or ridden. From a V8 drag bike with no clutch, to a 250 miles an hour rocket powered go-kart, to his land speed record attempts and his bid to break 1000 miles an hour. But before we get into Roscoe's wild story, I need to tell you about today's sponsor, Babbel. And this one is close to my heart. My wife is Colombian and I met her in Spain. I could speak a bit of Spanish and she could speak only a bit of English. 
And if I couldn't have pieced those few and very charming sentences together, we may not be together today. And it's also just very cool to be able to speak to people in other countries. They always look so happy when they realize you're really trying. So Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the world and is scientifically proven to help you start speaking a new language in just three weeks. It teaches you to have real world conversations. Lessons prepare you to have practical conversations about travel, business, and more. I'll be at Paul Ricard in May with our Drive NF1 car competition winners. So I've been brushing up on my French, très bien. These lessons are designed by real language teachers and there are multiple subscriptions for you to choose from. To join and get 60% off your subscription, click the link in the description. Now back to the video. So Roscoe's speed story starts with a bike named the Crazy Horse. The Crazy Horse was a V8 Chevy powered motorbike that was used for drag racing with a 9.1 second quarter mile best time and a top speed of 172 miles an hour. Now I'm all for going quick in a race car, but drag bikes just aren't for me. I mean, just look at the rider's position. The engine's so big on this thing that he's got nowhere to put his legs and it didn't even have a clutch. So to start it, he had to rev it up with the rear wheel spinning on the stand then drop it off the stand and then deal with whatever wheel spin the bike had. And according to Roscoe, it only just started gaining traction towards the end of the quarter mile. If that wasn't exciting enough, Roscoe then moved on to a rocket powered bike, which was so fast it was banned from the Australian tracks. It ran on hydrogen peroxide rocket fuel, which at first was extremely hard to come by before being banned by the Australian government. So in what looks like an effort to improve safety, Roscoe moved to the protection of four wheels with a rocket powered go-kart. Now, I'd be slightly more comfortable getting in this than the crazy horse, but not by much. This thing did the quarter mile in 5.9 seconds and reached a top speed of 253 miles an hour. To put that into perspective, the Red Bull RB7 F1 car did the quarter mile in 9.2 seconds and Arumak Nivera does it in 8.2. And even a top fuel dragster only does it in about four seconds. But again, that wasn't enough for Roscoe. He wanted to go even faster. And so he started his journey into jet powered vehicles, starting with the Aussie Invader one. And there he is, the man himself, Roscoe McLachlan in the Aussie Invader Jet Dragster. It was a dragster that produced 65,000 pounds of thrust and could reach a top speed of over 300 miles per hour. And as you can imagine, this thing was absolutely wild, with lots of fire, smoke and noise. He lets the brakes off and drives it straight down the middle of the track and looks like it's going to be a good one. Lots of fire, lots of noise and Roscoe's gone there with an 874 at 372 kilometers an hour. But that wasn't fast enough. What Roscoe really wanted was to be the fastest person in the world. And so his first attempt at the land speed record was with the Aussie Invader 2. Roscoe McGlashan came here putting 10 years of hard work and millions of dollars worth of other people's time and money on the line. And this thing was serious. It had an Atar 09C5 jet turbine as used in a Mirage fighter jet. The Invader 2 was 4,100 kilograms, 8.5 meters long, and had 36,000 horsepower. I mean, just look at it. It's not the prettiest machine, but it does look like it's gonna get the job done. And so in 1994, Roscoe went out with the Invader 2 at Lake Gardner in Australia. For context, at this point in time, the last record had been set by Richard Noble in the Thrust 2 at 634 miles an hour, but had remained unbeaten for over a decade. Initially, Roscoe's goal was to become the fastest Aussie in the world, which he managed to achieve. His wife, Cheryl, anxiously watching and waiting ashore, hoped they'd be a beautiful set of numbers. And they were. The average speed for the two runs was 801.3 kilometres per hour. We can bring the champagne. So we've got it, guys! We've got it! So, mightily impressive, but still not enough for Roscoe. There was still the overall land speed record to beat and the title of the fastest person on earth. So in 1995, the team returned to try it again, though things didn't go well. At almost 600 miles an hour, the Invader 2 broke through the salt surface and veered off course, crashing through timing equipment that was located 200 meters from the track's measured mile. A timing marker went through the engine Killed this engine, big black plume out the back of the engine, and the noise it made when it hit, it's just absolutely mind boggling. I got out of the car, I'm still alive. And that was the end of the Aussie Invader 2. It was completely written off. But even after a crash and not managing to break the record, Roscoe moved straight on to the Aussie Invader 3. He gets down and, and in the dumps for probably about five or ten minutes, 
after a disappointment and then he's back again. The Invader 3 was a reincarnation of the two, so it still had 36,000 horsepower and a Kevlar composite body. Again, designed and built in Australia. No one could appreciate how many, uh, how many man hours are going into building this and how much work and uh, to think that this car has been built here in this shed. And that's what I love about these projects. These guys are doing incredible things with quite a small team. They are purely driven by passion and I think we can all connect with that. And you might ask, what's the point in doing this? Spending all this time, effort and resource on just going faster. But it's simply to see if they can. So in 1996, Roscoe went back to Lake Gardner to try and beat Richard Noble's 634 miles an hour. With a new, faster car, Aussie Invader 3, Roscoe clocked 643 miles per hour in 1996, breaking Richard Noble's world mark. However, requiring a two-way pass to make it official, the team was again beaten by bad weather. However, things got even worse for the Aussie Invader team. In 1997, Andy Green and the British Thrust SSC team raised the bar to 763 miles an hour, the biggest increase the land speed record had ever seen, and one that Roscoe knew his Invader 3 couldn't get close to. It just wasn't designed for that kind of speed. So, as usual, Roscoe picked himself up and started again, with his eyes on this new and incredible benchmark. He spent the next 10 years planning and designing a car that could beat the thrust SSC and potentially break through the 1,000 mile an hour barrier. And that's where we're up to currently with the Aussie Invader 5. This is a typical suburban street on Perth's northern beaches. Now people build their big houses here, their big garages. Check out what this guy has in his garage. Yes, Roscoe is building a car capable of breaking 1,000 miles an hour in his garage at home. This car has been designed to travel from zero to 1,600 kilometres an hour. That's almost one and a half times the speed of sound in just 20 seconds. Okay, so let me give you the incredible stats. For this part of the video, I've relied heavily on the interview with Roscoe and his book, which again, you should check out. It's an absolutely brilliant story by Mark Reed. So the car, it's constructed with a bi-propellant rocket engine, providing 62,000 pounds of thrust, equivalent to about 200,000 horsepower. Its size is big too, with a length of 16 meters and a weight of nine tons, which is mostly fuel. And really, in essence, this car is pretty simple. It's basically a huge rocket which burns fuel with exhaust gases coming out of the back and pushing the car forward. So what will this record attempt actually look like? Well the car will take about 3 miles and just 22 seconds to accelerate to the measured mile. This is where the world record attempt and the speed measurement begins and hopefully at this point Roscoe will be doing the estimated 1000 miles per hour. Once Roscoe gets to this marker, he'll actually throttle back slightly, reducing power but maintaining speed. Otherwise, the extra speed would literally rip the wheels apart. As he'll be travelling at 1000 miles an hour, the mile will be covered in just three and a half seconds, after which his only job will be to stop the vehicle as safely as possible. The deceleration period will take another eight miles, which seems like a long way, but it's for good reason. First, if he were to shut the engines off too quickly, Roscoe would experience a high negative G and would probably pass out, which wouldn't be great. And second, the wheels would likely lose traction. Again, not what you want in a thousand miles an hour braking zone. So where do you even start when designing a car like this? Well, you start with the main thing stopping any car from going faster, the air. Before knowing what was needed from the rocket, Roscoe needed to understand the shape of the vehicle he was going to be pushing through the air, and most importantly, the coefficient of drag. Once he had that, he sent the findings to rocket expert and CEO of Rocket Lab, Peter Beck, to understand how much thrust he was going to require, which, as mentioned, was 62,000 pounds worth and capable of getting to 1,000 miles an hour in 22 seconds. And I'll be honest, I have no idea what 200,000 horsepower or 62,000 pounds of thrust really means or what it would look like. So here's a video of a rocket producing 54,000 pounds. And for a moment, just imagine being strapped to that. Now, one issue with rocket engines compared to jet engines is that they're much less predictable to drive, which isn't great for the driver. And you might also be asking, what is the difference between a rocket and a jet engine? 
Well, a jet engine draws in air from the atmosphere in order to burn the fuel, relying on the oxygen in the air for combustion, whereas a rocket engine carries its own supply of oxygen to burn that fuel. Now, there are many technical challenges, but one of the biggest problems to solve is the fact that this rocket is driving along the ground, not flying off into space. This means that feeding the rocket with fuel is a problem, as it's moving horizontally and not vertically. To resolve this, the car has seven six meter long aluminum tubes that have pistons to push the propellants into the engine's injector. Then when the propellants meet the engine, they ignite spontaneously and a load of thrust is created. And another reason these tanks are configured like this with pistons is so the liquid doesn't just slosh around. The last thing you want when accelerating to a thousand miles an hour is almost three tons of liquid moving about, side to side and front to rear. That isn't very good for the handling of a car. And what's incredible is that Roscoe's team have designed all of this themselves, as apparently they couldn't find anything off the shelf, which isn't really a surprise. So we've got enough power, but how do we hold everything together? The main part of the chassis is 12 meters long, with the whole Invader 5R being 16 meters. Now, that's very long, about one and a half times the length of a bus. And it's so long purely because of the amount of fuel that it needs to carry. The mainframe is a high grade steel tube, which is just under a meter in diameter. It was rolled from a flat piece of 10 millimeter thick steel and seam welded at the join. And just this mainframe alone weighs two and a half tons. That is a lot of metal. Mounted from the mainframe are the wheels, two at the back with a 2.3 meter track and two positioned very close together at the front. And these wheels are a really beautiful piece of engineering. The front wheels are positioned under the bodywork for aerodynamics and they're placed only 30 millimeters apart. Now, the Invader 5R could just use three wheels with one at the front, but that means that it then wouldn't qualify for the world record for which it needs four. Each wheel is made from some very expensive sounding aerospace aluminum and and they're massive, 90 centimeters tall and almost 20 centimeters wide. And they weigh 140 kilograms each. Now, just take a moment and think about what the wheel is actually doing here. Yes, they're big for the stability and the weight of the vehicle, but they're also spinning incredibly quickly. At 1,000 miles an hour, they'll be rotating close to their 10,000 RPM limit. Put that into perspective, that's about 10 times the RPM of a road car wheel and tire. And that's one of the reasons the Invader 5 doesn't have tires. At those speeds, they'd simply disintegrate. And the car could actually accelerate faster, but the team are holding it back because of the integrity of the wheels. If the car speeds up too quickly, the wheels, which aren't driven, wouldn't be able to spin up quickly enough. This could mean that the wheels are all spinning at different speeds to each other and a different speed to the vehicle as a whole. This in turn could cause a loss of traction, which again, isn't what you want. But with the tanks taking up so much space, where exactly does the driver sit and what are the considerations for the cockpit? Well, first, of course, it needs to be as safe as possible. So Roscoe will have a web of thick and strong tubing around him, along with all the safety devices you'd find in a race car. But one thing that you might not think about is the potential for not being able to see exactly where you're going. Roscoe is going to be strapped to a rocket with solid wheels and very limited suspension. The vibrations are going to be huge, and if he can't see where he's going, then it will be a massive problem. So the seat will be mounted on rubber and the roll cage will be strategically mounted to the mainframe in order to reduce the vibration as much as possible. And the position of the cockpit within the entire car is also important. For example, Spirit of America and Thrust SSC have their cockpits and driving position just behind the front wheels. According to Roscoe, sitting in that position means you can see and feel what the front of the car is doing, but you have little or no idea what's happening at the rear. So if the rear of the car is losing control, the driver might not feel it right away and that's a huge problem. But the Invader team realized that the best place for the driver is to sit about two thirds of the way down the car, just behind the center of gravity. There, Roscoe can feel what's happening at the back of the car while still seeing the front. And the team have learned from other previous attempts as well. When driving the Sonic Arrow car at 650 miles per hour, Craig Breedlove was thrown to one side, which in turn caused his foot to get jammed on the throttle pedal. So to protect from this, the Invader team have two throttle pedals instead of one. If Roscoe lifts his foot from either pedal, the engine will shut down, avoiding the issue that Breedlove had. Okay, 
okay, so we have power, we have a chassis, and we have a small space for the driver. But how do we keep it all on the ground? After all, this car is basically a massive rocket, and rockets are designed to go that way. Well, this is where aerodynamics come in, and as you know, we love aerodynamics on this channel. Aerodynamicists around the world are still understanding and evolving the theory of aerodynamics. It's deliciously complicated. Unfortunately, Willem didn't join me on this video, but the aero is still delicious. <laughs> the main things for the aero are the nose cone design, the tail fin, the canards, which are the winglets, it's just behind the front wheels and the v-shaped underbelly of the mainframe all of these things will help keep the wheels connected to the surface when driving at a thousand miles an hour first let's talk about the normal aero before we get into the problem of passing through the sand barrier which is quite a big problem actually just behind the front wheels we have these canards basically they're little winglets that adjust the weight over the front wheels and help keep the car stable and it's important to think about how the car's weight will be reducing quickly during the run as it uses is its propellant the center of gravity will also be changing and so the balance of the car the canards are there to offset that issue as the car burns propellant the front of the car becomes lighter and lighter and so the canards will add more angle and therefore more load to the front wheels to keep them connected to the surface on the other side of things if they have too much load which could cause the front to dig into the surface the canards will help unload now one of the most important aero parts of the Vader is the nose cone. As with an F1 car, the nose sets up the airflow over the rest of the car. But when you're going through the sand barrier, the aerodynamics get a bit weird. Back in 1979, Stan Barrett was the first person to break through the sand barrier in the Budweiser rocket. But things went wrong, and he was extremely lucky to survive. When a car or a plane passes through the speed of sand, it creates a shock wave, which can really disrupt the airflow and stability. But compared to planes, the effect on a car is stronger because the ground bounces that shock wave back into the car. So when the Budweiser rocket created the shockwave, it lifted its rear wheels off the ground for over 250 meters, at which point it's pure luck as to whether you crash or not. Luckily, Stan did not. Stan had broken the sound barrier. As he'd approached Mark 1, his two back wheels left the ground. He'd gone supersonic and come dangerously close to death. So the Invader team designed the chassis with an unusual V-shape. This is for stability. When the car creates the shockwave, the V-shape softens the blow somewhat and keeps the car more stable. Now, controlling the shockwave is one thing, but there's more. When the car is running subsonic below the speed of sound, a lot of the airflow can be predicted, as there's a decent amount of data available on cars running at this speed. But the problem comes when traveling at transonic and supersonic speeds. Now, transonic speed is when some parts of the car have subsonic airflow and other parts have supersonic airflow. What exactly does this mean and how does it happen? Well, to use an example, imagine a car is around the speed of sound. You have air flowing over the car, under the car, and around the sides. But the air flowing under the car might move faster in areas than the air flowing over the car. That means that you'll have some air that's subsonic and some that's supersonic. Basically, when the car reaches and passes through the speed of sound, it causes complex aerodynamics around the car, with different air pressures and forces acting on it. But all you need to know, really, is that ultimately it reduces the stability of the car. As you might imagine, there's very little real-world data about supersonic cars running on the ground as opposed to supersonic planes. So the team have used CFD to design the nose cone and the rest of the car to optimize for trans and supersonic speeds. But while it provides good insights, they know they need real world data. So they plan to run preliminary trials and methodical testing to ensure that they step their way up to speed. Pretty safe in the knowledge that the car isn't going to take off or be too disrupted by unusual airflows. So imagine Roscoe's averaged over 1000 miles an hour over the timing mile. He's done it, it's all great. But now he needs to slow down and ideally from his own instruction. And we want to slow down quickly, but not too quickly. In fact, it's going to take over eight miles, but for good reason. If Roscoe just shuts the engine off at a thousand miles an hour, he'd experience negative 16 G, at which point he'd black out and not be ready for the champagne at the end of the run. And we want to make sure that we're belt and braces here. So the Invader has five braking systems, 
engine shutdown, hydraulic air brakes, a high speed parachute, a low speed parachute, and an emergency brake. Now, that sounds like a lot, but he will be doing a thousand miles an hour after all. First, the engine shutdown. Basically, Roscoe lifts his foot off one of the two throttles and the engine will transition into deceleration mode. Don't forget the car is creating so much drag, it will actually decelerate incredibly quickly. Then at 800 miles an hour, he'll deploy the air brakes. They're located just behind the driver and continue to slow the car before the high speed parachute is deployed at 600 miles an hour. Then the low speed parachute is deployed at 400 miles an hour. And finally, at 200 miles an hour, the invader will use high speed disc brakes to bring the car to a complete stop. But what about the emergency brake? Well, of course, this is only to be used if one or more of the other braking systems fail. And it's very simple. It's basically a hydraulic steel ram with a flat metal plate on the end. It can be lowered from the bottom of the car and would dig into the ground to stop it. Probably not the best way to stop the car, so let's hope that Roscoe doesn't need to use it. And so, the big question. Will Roscoe and his team actually make this happen? Well, there's no getting around that technically and financially, it's a huge challenge. But having spoken to him on the podcast, I can safely say that he will never give up and I absolutely love that grit and determination. I've also read his book, which is a wild story that confirms his true grit and is actually very interesting from an engineering perspective too. I really recommend the read. You can find the book at aussieinvader.com forward slash the book. Please check it out as it will also help the continuation of their project. Now, these students built a car that did 0 to 100 kilometers an hour in less than a second with fascinating engineering. Check that out just here or click here for more. Thanks for watching and please consider subscribing.